Hi folks, this is all the fruit, and today I'm foraging in Mannheim, in Germany. Mannheim is just 20 kilometers, or what is it, 12, 13 miles away from Heidelberg. But for the avid botanist or forager, it's quite different. Uh, Mannheim is an industrial city, has a couple really big rivers, has a lot of sand dunes, and a much more continental climate than Heidelberg. It also has a botanical garden and a lot of parks and private gardens. I've never seen this one here. This one was made last year. But I'm checking what they have. Seems like somebody with a hatred for animal plants has made this little green space. Because the first sight I cannot see anything particularly edible. What a pity. This little green space here is much less well maintained, but in the past it has yielded a couple really interesting plants for me, including a couple edible ones and also useful in other ways. Yeah, Mannheim has a lot of really rare wild plants, a lot of them native and a lot of them exotic. Oh, here is something which I don't see a lot around Heidelberg, the little stinging nettle, Urtica urens. It's just as edible as the big one, but it is, yeah, even more painful. Also, I'm a little bit surprised it's growing now, we had quite a harsh winter. This actually... Hmm, this one this one likes warm climates, actually. Uh, outside the Upper Rhine Valley, which is this area here, which you could probably call the Upper Rhine Flat, where Mannheim and part of Heidelberg is situated. Outside of it in Germany, it's not too common, because the other areas of Germany are too cold for it. But this must have survived the winter, because look at that. That thick well branch stem didn't grow in the last couple of weeks. So, if I take this as a climate indicator, this shows me something which is quite contrary to all the stuff I'm seeing from Heidelberg. If I came to Germany and saw only this, I would have said, oh yeah, mild winter. Oh, whoa, oh, oh. whoa, here is the main ingredient in many witches' potions. Nah, YouTube is totally gonna demonetize me if I make a video on that. More Urtica Urens. Again, this stuff looks like it's been growing here for months. Very strange. All the plants in Heidelberg, all the climate indicators in Heidelberg shows quite a showed quite a harsh winter. The winters in Mannheim are harsher and the summers are hotter. Uh, because Mannheim is more continental. But yeah, this thing looks like it survived the winter. And here are even some specimens which look like they were hit by a drought in the last weeks. Not frost, but quite a serious drought if stuff starts drying up in the first days of April. And the last two weeks when I was in Germany were not too dry. Very, very, very strange signals. Very different from everything I've seen in Heidelberg the last two weeks. But I have a huge population of rabbits and also, of course, a huge population of rats. It also does have a population of hares. Heidelberg also has a population of hares and, of course, of rats, but likes the rabbits. So I would say that I don't know if the rabbits or the rats did this. I don't know what they looked for since they were digging around here so much. They must have been looking for a specific resource or just in general for resources. And resources for rabbits or rats can potentially also be good resources for humans. Also, a lot of digging uh, might have shown a, well, might have shown a harsh, no, a, a winter with thick snow, but no, but no harsh frost to freeze the ground. It might also have shown quite a mild winter or a winter with a lot of switches between harsh cold nights which killed off 
a lot of the resources, a lot of the food stuff, and then mild periods where it was possible to dig out the roots. Hmm. Oh, the miner's lettuce. This thing, Claytonia perfoliata, I think it's from, I think it's from uh, New Zealand, but for example, uh, after the California, well, during the California gold rush, this used to grow on the, on the uh, heaps, on the dirt heaps next to the, uh, next to the gold mines, and so the miners whose diet lacked a lot in fresh greens were using it on mass because, yeah, um, bacon and beans, bacon and beans, bacon and beans. That gives you constipation, so you need some good salad. So the miner's lettuce is a very good salad and quite widespread in the sandy areas around Mannheim. Actually, invasive on mass in the sandy areas around Mannheim. The nettle is also quite a good salad. Well, if you kind of destroy the spines. The chickweed is an excellent salad. Uh, however, Mercuria, Mercurialis annua, another quite frost sensitive plant, is quite, is quite toxic. You should stay away with it, as you should from the Senezio. What was Senezio called? Something with old plants. And also this year could either be the mildly toxic dog parsley, or it could be uh, what did they use to kill Socrates with? Well, I, I think poison is enough that it was used for executions in ancient Greece. The flying rats, they might be pretty dirty, but don't forget, if you are a meat eater, in a, in a survival situation, if you manage to catch them, it's still quite a lot of meat. I'm a vegetarian, so you are allowed to continue. Well, what are you foraging for, little ones? Uh, some nice granny put out some grains. Actually, ornithologists don't like people to put out the grains because it just leads to pollution of the area. Our winters are not so, so harsh anymore that the birds need food and the pigeons certainly don't. But it was as one guy from a, from the Ornithological Society of Germany once told me, yeah, we maybe have a couple thousand ornithologists among our members and a couple hundred thousand old grannies who like to feed the pigeons. Where do you think our money comes from? Of course we are not going to say anything against feeding the birds. Well, this is the more winter hardy nettle. Urtica dioica, the big nettle. And here among it there is the white nettle, which is not a nettle, but it's in the labiaceae. It has those big white flowers and it has no stingers. Yeah, but there was a real one among the other ones. Both are edible. Both taste quite different. You shouldn't confuse them, but in this case, even if you would confuse them, nothing would happen to you because both are edible. Thistles. I think this is Cardo spinosissimus, or was it Sirzium spinosissimum? <coughs> Very rare thistle in other parts of Germany. It means the spiniest one. And yeah, when they grow older, they are very spiny. But they are also edible. And also, around here in Mannheim, Mannheim is very unique in this aspect. There are a lot of plants which are very rare in other parts of southwestern Germany, but very common in Mannheim. A different thistle species over there. I'm waiting for the tasty stems of the thistles to <laughs> come out. As long as you can push past the thorns, past the spines, thistles are one of the tastiest things you can forage in the German spring. A dock, and this looks like the curly dock, Rumex crispus, which is actually edible. Mm -hmm. It is Rumex crispus. Usually in Germany, in such situations, you find Rumex optosifolius, which is not edible. This is the curly dog. It tastes like a sorrel, which is less sour. 
which is a good thing because you cannot, you shouldn't eat sour sorrel in big amounts. This dog, because it has less oxalic acid, you can eat it in bigger amounts. Very nice and plentiful spring resource. Here you can see uh, most of those plants are really tiny, maybe because they are being cut regularly in summer. But they can grow to like a couple times this size, and then you can get big amounts of big amounts of leaves with little effort, and you can use them for salads and also for a lot of things to cook. Yeah, I know this is a fruit foraging channel, and I hope I'll find a couple fruits or at least nuts or seeds for you. But the winter seems to have been quite harsh, despite those strange signals the little nettles were giving me. So, most of the fruits will not have survived. Speaking of the harsh winter, here we have a couple weeds. Hmm, this could have been... This could have been a nightshade. Those could have been nightshades which did freeze completely. But I'm not sure, they look like nightshades, but they are not very well preserved. So I cannot use them as a sure indicator for the coldness of last winter. Burdock, very valuable foraging resource. Well, you can use it as toilet paper. You can use the seeds. Uh, but especially the reason, the main reason why it's being cultivated, for example, in uh, uh, in places like Japan, is for its big edible roots. I tried them only once. I think I should try them again. Very strange. This should be a Brionia dioica, a relative of cucumbers and melons which grows wild in huge amounts around here, but the leaves look very strange. The leaves look almost like watermelons. Here we have another Brionia dioica with more or less typical looking leaves. However, this, those leaves look very strange. And maybe I should come back later in the year and see if the fruits look strange. I'm still sure it's Brionia dioica, but I've seen thousands of them, I've never seen one with such leaves. A mass of elderberries is growing in the parks of Mannheim. In a couple weeks those will have nice edible flowers and later nice edible fruits. There are so many preparations with elderberry flowers and fruits. Quite a valuable food source. Just don't eat them raw because they can and will upset your stomach. Germans call this plant Geomorbanum. Well, no, the Germans don't call it Geomorbanum. That's what the botanists call it. The Germans call it Nelkenwurz or clove root. In older times, poor people who couldn't afford imported cloths from Southeast Asia would ra rather use the root of this thing, which seems to have a similar flavor to cloves. But I never tried to use the root for cooking. Please tell me if you've ever tried it. An apple tree growing in this tiny little inner courtyard that it's flowering. In Germany officially, the flowering of the apple tree signifies the phenological start of spring. That means, yeah, you have a certain date on which spring officially starts, but the, the weather and the year is advanced enough to say that spring starts for the plants when the apples start flowering. They could have taken some other tree, like cherries or plums or something. They decided on the apple. So everywhere in Germany, meteorologists are looking at the apple trees. When they start flowering, they say spring has officially started in our area. And there are a lot of maps uh, at which date the spring usually starts in Germany. Of course, it's different every year, but there is like an average, which is of course also only a temporary thing because of climate change, but it's quite good. This map is quite good to see uh, areas with longer and shorter growing season, which is just as important as the winter hardiness maps, where most countries have adapted the American system. Winter hardiness is very important, but the length of the growing season is also very important and people usually know for this plant 
you plant it like two weeks before the apples flower for the southern plant you plant it four weeks after the apples flower so it's quite a good help for farming and gardening the Mannheim Palace this is its back site let's see around palaces there are often interesting plants Capsella Bursa Pastoris or Shepherd's Purse it seems that the Westerners have been foraging the greens and flowers and fruits for thousands of years but some Chinese like to make dumplings specifically with the roots the roots are very small and they don't provide much nutrition but they seem to provide a very specific flavor also daisies all parts of the daisy are edible but in Heidelberg they were a little bit too tough and even bitter what about here Nah, not so good. Also Muscari. I said in one of my last videos that Italians like to pickle the bulbs and somebody else said in our area nobody uses the bulbs but use the flowers for jellies and other things. Let's scare this German by approaching it with a knife. I think I was kidding. So, nicht erschrecken, ich will hier nur die Distel ernten. So, well, I told him that I'm not dangerous and that he shouldn't get scared. I'm just after this absolutely delicious thistle stem. Oops, okay cut away too much from it yeah. mm. the peel not only has the spines in the hairs but also a lot of tough fibers they salty and savory that's good mm. means it has quite a lot of nutrients and electrolytes and stuff <laughs> mm. <laughs> the guy is still observing me from time to time yeah this strange bum with an open knife <laughs> eating strange plants in the middle of the city yeah Every time I put my phone at him, he looks away. <laughs> uh, we cannot blame him, can we? Uh, for one moment, I hoped I had found Devil's Walking Stick. Then I thought it's the ubiquitous Ailantus, but no, this is something different. What is this? Uh, big, big leaves with second degree leaflets like this is the petiole and those are the secondary petioles uh, what is this i think it is some relative of devil's walking stick oh this i think this is some relation it was planted here as an ornamental devil's walking stick is edible so folks maybe you can research whether this thing is edible it has very conspicuous giant leaves with yeah second degree leaflets palace looks a bit more impressive from the front all those small states in western and southwestern germany a couple hundred years ago they all tried to compete with france uh, and build palaces the size of the french ones and of course none of those states had the economic uh, the economic uh, potential to do this those countries were very poor and small and weak but of all those countries the palatinate the, the smallest and poorest of those countries actually managed to make a palace with they say two more windows than Versailles than the French royal palace uh, of course it bankrupted the state but who cares 
if we have two more windows than the frogs, that's worth ruining the country. Look at this magnificent old tree. Either I've never seen it or I've forgotten about it. It's even a protected tree. There is a label here, which means that it should be generally, well, usually this is given to trees which are over a hundred years old, but <laughs> a guy who dealt with giving trees legal protection actually said, ah, sometimes people do it for different reasons. Sometimes the neighbor says this tree is too old, cut it down. So they try to get the tree protected stages in order to not have to cut the tree down. But this is a mulberry tree, folks, and it's ancient. Mannheim and also those, yeah, basically all those little states in southwestern Germany, another thing they copied from France, which would, they hoped would make them a lot of money and save them a lot of money, was growing mulberries, not for the fruits, but to breed the silkworms, because rich people wear silk, and yeah, they didn't want to buy all the silk from France, from France and China. So they started growing mulberries here. This tree is probably well over a hundred years old. Beautiful old mulberry tree. Two main stems have survived. They are hollow. There are several generations of uh, attempts to save them. As you can see here, those metal pipes are almost dead. And then they are... Uh, no, no, no. The way they have done this... You don't wrap, you don't wrap this stuff around the, you don't wrap anything around the branches. It's a bit counterintuitive, but actually you drill a big screw into the branch and attach the, and attach the, uh, uh, the ropes to it like they did here with the metal ropes. So I think the, uh, the cloth ropes and the, and the, uh, and all those wrappings, that's, that's just temporary. Beautiful tree, why don't I remember it? Under big trees, there is usually less rain. But look at that. It's really dry here. Really dry. Now, the dried up nettles make sense. If you look here, well, when you are camping or homeless, staying under such a tree can be quite nice because look here, it's so dry. Nothing grows here. And here be between this dry spot and this mouse hole, which of course provides additional drainage, the tasty edible chickweed is dying. So yeah, this tree shows me, among many other things, that the last couple of weeks have been more dry in Mannheim than in Heidelberg, which I could already have guessed from the, uh, from the little nettles, but this is a confirmation. Two very similar plants growing here together. This is a clover and it's edible. And this, with also trifoliate clover like leaves, is a sorrel, which is also edible. Both are not closely related, and when they are flowering, you can see that they are not. But both are edible. So is the dead lion here. Oh, and here, uh, what was the Sanguisorba. The Germans call this cucumber wheat. Some say it tastes of cucumbers, which it doesn't. But a lot of them like to pickle cucumbers with this wheat. Never found out what it does, but it is called cucumber wheat in German. It, it is apparently quite important to the Germans, but it's quite a confusing thing for me. Oh, look at this beautiful... Is it an Italian ape or is it some Chinese copy? They used to be so ubiquitous in Italy in the late 20th century. Mostly farmers were using them, though they have almost disappeared, but at least there are a couple left in Germany. Yes, I know this is a fruit channel and not a car channel, but I have the attention span of a four-year-old. Deal with it. 
three Japanese maples. Those grow very slowly. A lot of the other maples grow very fast. Those grow very slowly. It's said that most maples are edible. Hmm. A bit sour. If I had come here a little bit earlier, a week or two, they might have been down. Now they are a bit tough. <coughs> But they cannot taste any bad taste, so, yeah. When they were still very young, they might have been really good, especially if they hadn't been a drought. And those here, tons and tons of miners' lettuce. That's what I mean by it being invasive. On sand, the soil around Mannheim, <coughs> that Mannheim is mostly built on sand. This is a real pest. Yeah, Mannheim was built here in the swamps between the Rhine and the Neckar because there's a sand dune behind the palace. Actually, the original village was built on the sand dune. And until now, a lot of people in Mannheim, <laughs> when they get a garden here, <coughs> they often don't know what to expect. Almost desert-like conditions in summer. Sand and, yeah, a soil which you have to fertilize a lot. But such things, you should know such things when you make a garden or when you want to forage around here. Yeah, here the center of Mannheim. I bet not even 1% of the people who are living here know that this is actually, this was actually built in a sand flat. Of course, not the desert, the forested sand flat, but the main, the main road in Mannheim is actually called Planken, which means planks. Well, before it was called Planks, it was called Auf dem Sand, which means on the sand. Yeah, it was basically a sandy road, and then they put planks on the road, because back then, bringing stones here, they are, they are not naturally occurring stones in the whole region. Bringing stones here was too expensive, so they fortified the road with planks, basically made it into a giant boardwalk. Or some others say they put the planks on the side so that the rich pedestrians did not get sprayed by the dirt. But still, one of the main roads in Mannheim was called on the sand. Nowadays, there are no, not many traces of this, but as soon as you get a dry summer, Mannheim suffers disproportionately, and your foraging here might suffer disproportionately, because, yeah, of the very dry, sandy soil. A little cherry tree. There are no cherry trees around, but people who bought some cherries from the market spit them out, or it could have been a bird. A cherry tree growing somewhere in Germany, wild, is nothing special, but in Mannheim, if you look for such type of little trees, you might find a lot of hidden treasures, which I hope we're gonna do today. Here, by the way, I guess also a lot of dogs use this place as a toilet. This chickweed is so big and juicy, but I'm not gonna harvest it. Olives in pots have become quite popular around here. This is actually the wild variety. Olea Europea var oleaster. You can see it by those well, by the darker green leaves and also by those quite stiff branches, quite stiff twigs going off in almost a, in almost a, a 90 degree angle. And those twigs, especially if there is a lot of grazing, the remnants of them, after they've been bitten off, will be quite uh, stiff and thorny and provide Almost something like thorns to protect the little tree from more grazing. And actually, olives in the Mediterranean, just with a lot of other trees in many parts of the world, you can basically see a shrub which is growing very slowly, millimeters or one or two centimeters per year in each direction because it's being pruned by goats and sheep. And then finally it becomes so big they cannot eat a couple stems which come out of the middle of the shrub and then those become trees within a couple years. <laughs> the shrub might have waited for decades or even for centuries to grow big enough that there is one space in the middle which the goats cannot reach. And yeah, you can often see this with the oleaster, with the wild olive. 
guess peeing so high is a challenge. Of course, people still might be spitting in here, but a man needs to eat. And what does he eat? The same as the chickens. I always wondered why this is called chickweed until somebody told me. Yeah, the chickens totally love it. They get quite crazy when they get to eat this stuff. This is the market square. No market today, but because the trees are protected with those metal things, a lot of plants grow here. It especially, yeah, trees from discarded fruit pits or discarded fruits. This is most probably a plum, but it could also be an apricot. This is an apple. Here a rose. I wonder how this showed up here. There is no source of rose, hips or rose seeds nearby, which I'm aware of. Well, on a completely different note, just like in Heidelberg, the nightshades have frozen down to the roots. After mild winters, actually, almost the whole plant survived, even the leaves, even the fruits, and you could forage a lot, a lot of nightshade fruits in March and April, and then they continued, basically, in those mild years, you could forage a lot of nightshade fruits during all 12 months, but now they are dead. The new nightshades are just sprouting, so it will take a couple more months because, before we can forage tasty nightshade fruits again. Another apple tree, but what I'm looking for are apricot trees. I've seen apricot trees in those situations for several years now. Feral apricot trees are quite typical for Mannheim. Actually, when I was a student here in the 90s, there was a feral apricot tree growing out of the wall, well, at the base of the wall, at the base of a shaft in front of my window at school. And it was very thorny, it was about three meters tall, producing buckets full of, full of apricots every year, which was a very amazing thing back then because basically nobody else knew that feral apricots are even a thing in Germany and this one was producing so many fruits that it had an actual chance to create a whole population. In Heidelberg, I just started seeing feral apricots in the last years. Ah, here is one apricot tree. Actually, not even one. It looks like there are at least two, three. Well, they could also be three stems of the same tree. Yeah, this is one of those feral apricot trees which are quite typical for the continental climate of Mannheim. I've seen them also in several other areas in the sandy plains in and around Mannheim, but you would hardly ever see them in Heidelberg. Feral peaches, plums, pears, apples, cherries, a lot of them. Walnuts, yes, but apricots, guess you need the Mannheim climate for them. One of the big supermarket chains, sometimes they have slightly different selection than in Heidelberg, despite uh, basically the stuff being distributed more or less equally to all supermarkets here in the region. But the supermarkets here in the region usually get a better selection than the ones in other parts of Germany. However, today I don't see anything interesting here, but do not despair. There are tons of special shops in Germany which do get their own fruits and veg distributed. Of course, I'm talking about the various ethnic shops here. The difference between the ethnic shops in Mannheim and in Heidelberg is, in Heidelberg, they usually cater for yuppies and uh, rich expats. Here they care for normal workers, usually of the same nationality as the shopkeepers. That's why they are often considerably cheaper, although a couple years ago the prices in Mannheim jumped quite a lot. Most famous one are the Turkish ones, there is a whole Turkish, uh, uh, Turkish business district behind the market. 15 to 20 years ago the Turks had a very 
a very nice custom they would buy overripe fruits uh, from the from the grosses for pennies and sell them for a price still cheaper than the German supermarkets which sold mostly unripe fruits so here you would get nice ripe fruits for quite low prices I love chopping here but unfortunately they have abandoned that practice and now you just get slightly more diverse and slightly cheaper fruits and veggies here than in the normal shops also since the time when Erdogan started fighting with the West they stopped receiving so many fruits from Turkey and now most of the stuff actually comes from Spain well the quinces are from Turkey somebody asked me where to get Lokvat seeds well here also ah, that's interesting yesterday I bought the passion fruit for 1 euro 30 here they are for 50 cents 49 they are big they are one of the modern tasty varieties actually it was exactly the passion fruits I bought for 1 euro 30 yesterday well I definitely got to stock up on them those are nice big passion fruits almost a hundred grams a piece at least the bigger ones and yeah five euro five euro a kilo five six euro a kilo for passion fruits in Germany mm -hmm. it's actually quite a good price also did you hear the Turkish vendor saying alles full that means everything is full what he referred to is quite a good thing I actually made the video about this passion fruit this morning quite good quality and the passion fruit is full full to the brim with tasty tasty seeds and pulp so yeah definitely going back here is another Turkish shop they do have well oh here another very interesting thing in the EU you basically cannot sell cannot sell fruits which are too small or too crooked but here they have the special the special division Krumbgurken or well should be Krumbgurken but they are all native speakers which means uh, crooked or curved cucumbers and yeah 4 euro for cucumbers ah, but wait here there are other cucumbers for 2 euro I think I will get the mini cucumbers instead of the curved ones would like to know how much the pomegranates are this used to be my favorite fruit at one point but in the last couple years somehow I don't like it so much anymore let's delve a little bit deeper into the Turkish shop the nice flat beans those are being grown a lot around Heidelberg but I still don't see them in the German shops Oh, look at that here, fava beans. Those are actually not beans, but totally other fabaci. And yeah, the, the prices are okay. Lady fingers, a lot of different peppers and chilies. This is very typical for Turkey. They have a huge diversity of peppers and chilies. And this is in April. In summer, they will have a lot more. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, since Erdogan started fighting with the EU, basically the selection is more of a European one than a Turkish one. There are a couple Turkish things, but, well, and since Erdogan start, started becoming best chums with uh, Putin, actually, uh, Turkey, uh, yeah, Turkey is exporting most of their fruit, uh, fruit and veg to Russia, which is a pity because usually the Turkish stuff is of better quality than the EU stuff speaking of pomegranates not here but I think under the next tree there were a couple tiny feral pomegranate trees last year of course those spots are being cleaned from time to time from vegetation oh they uh, okay ignore the doggy poo but here is the tiny, at least one of those tiny pomegranate trees has survived. Yeah. So yeah, in this ethnic district, 
Yeah, the, the fruit at which diversity is not as great as it was ten, uh, ten, twenty years ago, but it's still totally worth visiting when you're in Mannheim. Ah, now we are talking business. Never found anything like this in Heidelberg. It's not one of the biggest apricot trees, but it's nice enough. Three centimeter stem over an inch, over two meters tall, over seven feet tall, covered with, well, I bet there were dozens of fruits, but all of the lower ones are gone, I wonder why. Did some short person pick them? Because I can still totally reach those here. And some nice person also kind of tight it so that it doesn't spread too much. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised it survived here to that age. I mean, it is a spidey wild apricot or feral apricot tree. Uh, I'm sure all the fruits will be picked by somebody while they are still unripe. But still, I will be here in a couple months and if I don't forget, I will check this one. There are already two things I have to check in June. The mulberries and this apricot tree. Um, yeah, I came looking for the Turkish coffee shop where I drank some orchid drink years ago. Completely illegal in Germany. I don't know if they just smuggled the concentrate as a powder or something, or if the version I drank in Germany didn't even contain orchids. Yeah, but it's gone. Probably moved somewhere else, but now I have to check all the coffee shops, which one sells bootlegged orchid drink. Yeah, unfortunately, human consumption is one of the biggest problems for orchids in Turkey. Arabian, Moroccan, Iranian, Afghan, Pakistani, Indian. That sounds good. The selection is quite... Whew. Uh, I want this stuff. I want this stuff. Yes, the selection is considerably better than in similar shops in Heidelberg. Those should be Luna beads or Lima beads. Bottle gourds, different types. Oh, what was this? Amla, yes. And those little those little cucumber melons, so typical in Southeast Asia. Aloe vera, the leaves are much bigger than on my plants. White, white uh, eggplants. I like this shop. <laughs> I just got this for one third of the price. But the mangoes, yeah, smell quite good. Alfonso, isn't it a little bit early for Alfonso? Mm. Chirimoya, uh, mangosteen. I think I'll rather opt for the rambutan. Thai bananas from Mexico. So, well, though the star apples are not good. This should be Moringa. Also, the herbs are nice and fresh. I like this place. Bitter cola and snake fruit. Yummy. Now I'm in an Indian shop. Also nice selection. Unripe mangoes, white eggplants, snake gourd, banana flowers, Thai eggplants, unripe papayas. Nice. What is this? Some sort of taro? Well, nothing for me around here. Pity. There is no variety of those mangoes, just mango from the Dominican Republic. I want those. I'm running out of money, but there are a lot more ethnic shops here than Google shows me.
Well, this one has some more standard fruit selection. No rarities, unfortunately. Oh, this one doesn't seem to have fresh fruits. Afro-Asian, that sounds good. Mother India's Afro-Asian shop is run by a Chinese woman, incredibly friendly. She told me she has no exotic fruits, but told me I will find those rather around the train station, not in this part of town. <laughs> so what did I find the last hour or so? Little India, well, looks like this is only a restaurant. However, often they don't make such a big... Uh, division between shop and restaurant okay nothing here but there are more ethnic shops the other way well nothing forageable around here and except running out of money I'm also running out of battery this church slash school has a nice garden a lot of beautiful flowers I think this will only get better in May and June but they also have a veggie garden, of course we don't pick from that. We don't want to break some little kid's heart. Current. Look at the cute painted rocks. Mm. Muggy leaf. Collection of different herbs, raspberries. They used to have more veggies. Oh yeah, we recently established that linden flowers. Actually, not too bad. Bah, those were bitter. No, haben Sie asiatisches Obst? Ah, guavn schon mal, nice. Guavn, aber sonst haben Sie nicht viel, oder? Ah, okay, vielen Dank. New Asia head shop. <laughs> this Native American has been here for decades. By the way, those exact statues are the reason the Bali rice terraces are getting destroyed. But that's for another video. Go Asia. It has a bigger selection than the one in Heidelberg. It's a chain. Mangosteen, durian, jackfruit, rose apple. Logans, oh, so tasty. And now off to the train station, where the good Asia fruit shops are supposed to be. Another Go Asia supermarket. The thing I filmed this morning is actually a Castanea Henryi. Ah, interesting. And last but not least, Asia Mark Kimha. They have a couple of really interesting stuff. Those huge Asia pears, huge milk apples, huge king mangoes, nice long guns, and they have baby mangoes and Chinese plums. Hmm. And water apples and dragon fruit. Wow, they have a lot of nice stuff. Pity I already bought so much. And they have a lot more here. Oh my. It's mostly veggies, but oh, what is this? Oh, it's unripe hook plums. Bought a Korean pear, but definitely have to visit this place again. <laughs> Sorry, folks, that this started as a foraging trip. It ended up as an exotic fruit shopping trip, but that's the life of a fruit forager. You grab what you find.